Hello, I'm Paul Staniforth and I'm a Network Systems Analyst at Leeds Beckett University. And we're going to do a presentation on how we're using OVER to provide a number of courses, but in this case, one particular course. So one of the courses we provide involves using a VDI solution so we can teach cybersecurity in a sandbox realistic environments, including to remote students. So Leeds Beckett University has gone through a different restructuring and name changes from Leeds Polytech to Leeds Metropolitan University and Leeds Beckett University. And we're in the north of England in Leeds, obviously. The way we used to do teaching, what was it? We still have this facility. We have a PC networked workstations set up. That's got three labs of 25 PCs each, so there's 75 PCs in total, and they're fairly uh, heavy duty workstations. So, to provide uh, things like installing operating systems and saving operating systems, we use a scripted in house system that we call IMS. This allows us to save multiple operating system based workstations and also dual boot Windows and Linux systems. The students can then save their work at the end of the lesson and restore it again. So we were looking for a product to uh, replace most of this teaching. And we decided to look for a managed KVM solution. Uh, we liked that it was free and open source software. And also it was very, very useful that it had an open software development kit and an API so that we could do more in-house development to suit our needs. The fact that it supported multiple uh, languages as well as the web API was also a big plus. The community support was option for getting Red Hat support should the management feel we needed it was also a factor. And we can envisage the service being growing and extra courses and modules being added so the fact that it was scalable and manageable was very useful for our consideration. So the first stage we did was we had a proof of concept based on PC workstations. Then we took a number of students and let them do a taster course and then give back feedback to tell us how they felt it suited the teaching of their course. The next stage was to plan and integrate overt into the course modules. The original setup, we had one data center, one cluster and three HP hosts with I believe they had 192 gigabytes of memory each and 24 cores per host. The resource usage started going up, especially as more courses came on board and they started using more Windows VMs. We used a number of methods to mitigate that we used a lot of shared memory and template and linked templates, but especially in the case of 
Windows, the memory usage was always going up. And we ended up having over 500, uh, 1500 VMs running at some stages. So we've had to upgrade the system a number of times. And although we've kept the same structure, the first stage was add memory to the free original hosts. So they were taken to 288 gigabytes of memory each. Then we purchased four extra hosts. These were um, modular servers. So that allowed us to put four, the four hosts in a single 2U shutter. And that served as lots of rack space. The, the actual usage kept going up and it was very popular, so we've actually purchased eight more hosts that will be coming online in the next academic year. So we've increased the memory a lot. The, the number of servers has increased, so that gives us a lot of flexibility. One of the things that we found is our first four hosts, we had single socket servers which was a, a stopgap to, to increase the memory really but one of the features of having a single socket rather than dual socket server is you have a reduced memory bandwidth. So the security courses were all originally running on these local IMS workstations and they were using things like VMware Player and virtual box to provide the students with virtual machines so they could learn the different operating systems and security aspects of those. Most of these have now moved on to overt. So some of the advantage, advantages with the overt system is there's a time penalty of running VMs on the physical machines on that. IMS system. So the, at the beginning of the lessons, they had to download and restore the machine images. And then at the end of the lesson, there was, they had to then save the machine images. It also is less, less flexible for timetabling purposes. It's it, with the overt, it gives us more flex, a more flexible approach and it's quicker to roll out updates and changes and new uh, course modules challenges for the students. There's also less maintenance needed by the students because one of the ways of working at home before was for the students to save or download virtual machine images and then install them on the home computers using uh, software such as VirtualBox and VMware Player. Another advantage is they can access the VMs remotely and on site and they have the same kind of experience no matter which system they use. It also means it's easier for the staff to support the students, especially when they're working remotely. And also it gives more options for group working. One of the things with the networking, as far as security was concerned, is the general VM network we have is separated from the actual service type network. So the storage, DNS, management, migration, and those kind of network connections are using a separate network infrastructure. Whereas the VM network that the students used use for their uh, purposes, they're on a separate switch. And in fact, it's an ERGAS, an ERGAP switch 
that's not actually connected to anything else. If there requires any outside access apart from this isolated switch, such as installing software on the VMs, we provide a proxy appliance. So for remote access for students to get to their VMs, the two things they require is web access to the portal, and that's only over HTTPS as the normal HTT port is redirected to the secure port. And the other thing is they need the console ports on the overhaus for connections to SPICE and VNC. At present, the university provides two methods to achieve this. One is a remote app service, and that kind of provides a jump box so they'll, the students will log into the remote app server, launch the browser on that, and utilize Vert Viewer on that server to connect to the overt system. There's also a VPN service so they can connect to the university. And we've found that both methods have uh, provided some issues and it's it's been exacerbated when the university moved to fully online distance learning as part of the COVID-19 situation. To get improved remote access, things we're looking at is ways of, well, one way would be to provide access through the firewall to the HTTPS in the portal and also console ports for SPICE and VNC on the overt host. One thing we could use would be a separate display, display network in the DMZ to provide the console access. We could also use a SPICE proxy for SPICE connections, but there's no such proxy for VNC connections. We could use the web so socket proxy for no VNC, but that's not the ideal uh, connection method because it's not quite as useful and flexible as the pure VNC connection using Remote Viewer. One of the special use cases we have is, is provided with port mirroring. So we can do a, a networks snooping scenario. The thing with this port mirroring is it's software only. And what they used to do when they were running machines in virtual box and VM players and such like is they had a host only network so that they could do packet capture, intrusion detection, and that kind of uh, scenario. The network snooping only working works on the legacy Linux bridge, so unfortunately it's not set up to use OVN networking at present. We provide 20 logical networks. These are all named the same and they run on all the hosts, so in effect when we have our full complement of uh, hosts running, we'll have over 200 logical networks available so that the students won't uh, be interfering with each other and seeing each other's traffic. So, as I said, the the port mirroring is software only. It runs on the Linux bridge within each overt host. So it only works if 
all the VMs that you're mo that are using that network are actually running on the same host. And to achieve that, we use affinity groups, and we have a positive hard affinity with a VM VM rule to make sure that all VMs within a particular group run on the same host. Obviously, it'd be more flexible if we could achieve the same thing using OVM networks. So, as you can see here, if we have a number of VMs running and a number of hosts and logical networks, what we do is we attach each host to all the logical networks and it's a feature of the management setup that it has to use uh, a, a network interface to to actually connect these we don't actually we we don't actually use a network interface to, is physically attached to any network so that's an, another level of security so it's all working within the host itself but we have to have these connections and these are VLAN tagged to create the 20 logical networks then the, then VMs can either use the normal VNIC profile or the VNIC profile we've created that has port marine enabled so that they can do uh, packet inspection, intrusion detection with software such as Wireshark and Snort. And like I said, we force these groups of VMs to be on the same host by putting them in an affinity group that has a VM affinity that's positive and enforcing. One of the um, original problems with this is the migration wouldn't work. So to migrate any of the VMs, such as when the host went into maintenance, we had to break the affinity rule, migrate them, and then re-implement the affinity rule. But now over allows you to, to migrate a vm and all the vms in the same affinity group so there's an option to do that as part of the software which has solved some of our problems so next one of my colleagues Cl colleagues cliff schroders is going to talk about uh, some of the software we're using at least beckett university secgen Activity and Hackerbot. Thank you. Hi, Ever Conference um, 2020. Uh, my name is Cliff Schroders. I'm a reader in cybersecurity at Leeds Beckett University. I'm going to tell you about some of the technical frameworks that we've created uh, that build on um, and rely heavily on uh, over. Uh, the over infrastructure um, and so we have uh, ways of generating hacking challenges and infrastructure for infrastructure for delivering all of that uh, that's built on uh, over um, so I'm going to talk to you about that so when we teach cyber security we um, include offensive security um, and um, if when we teach students how to break into systems, it helps them to understand and develop a security mindset so that they can um, approach systems that they then see in the future in terms of how would this system be broken? What's What are the potential security problems with this? Gives them the hands-on experience with hacking tools um, and we want them to have vulnerable systems um, to you know, have that experience of doing the ethical hacking 
Um, and, you know, because hacking is fun, why wouldn't you do that? Um, it's a fun way to teach security um, and it's, it's also beneficial for students. Uh, and one of the ways we do that is to use a CTF style approach. The, this is a photo, some photos of a CTF event that we ran um, with um, uh, using the frameworks I'm about to talk to you about. Um, and basically, if you don't already know what a CTF is, it's where you have a competition or challenges, and when you solve those challenges, you're given a flag, which is basically, it might be the word flag, but then a random string, and you can submit that for marks to prove that you've solved the challenge. Um, and so we use um, this approach heavily in terms of ways to make our, um, our curriculum engaging and interesting by giving students like weekly challenges to solve. And so they solve the challenge, they submit the flag, and that gives them marks. Um, sometimes the marks are just for fun, so there's leaderboards and things with students, and sometimes it actually contributes to their grades. So we face a lot of challenges in terms of how we um, do this stuff. So um, I won't read through this whole list you can see on the screen, but if you want you can pause it. But this is a starting point of some of the challenges that we face in terms of using hacking challenges um, and having an infrastructure uh, that allows students and teachers um, the freedom to do different things, to explore things, to do the hacking, um, to do exploit development and, and a malware analysis in kind of a safe environment and to be able to reset things when things go wrong and protect our university infrastructure from our students. So the, um, the main um, framework or software that we've um, developed uh, for doing um, this, this stuff is called SecGem. Um, and um, so you can see here it's open source. Um, there's quite you know quite a few people have um, you know been shown interest in it um, you know outside of our institution, um, and we've you know got quite a lot of people have contributed code to this thing. Uh, but it's all free and open source software, so if you're interested, you can go and um, have a look at the SecGen project. Um, basically, what it allows us to do is it, it is a framework for generating virtual machines that are um, have randomized security challenges in them, including um, the provisioning of vulnerabilities within the systems that are created. So we create systems that are intentionally vulnerable, not secure, and then which can be broken um, in order to, um, in some cases, find flags that you can then submit for marks, for example. Um, but there's literally hundreds of different um, types of you know, security um, problems and things that can, um, you know, ways that information can be encoded and the ways that software can be configured. Um, and it can, um, basically, the, the randomization is um, completely under our control in terms of the scenarios that we create. Um, and so we can create scenarios that are um, match what we want to teach or the kind of challenges we create. Uh, and the use case for SecGen is for, um, you can do more realistic type scenarios where there's no flags, there's just a bunch of vulnerable systems for a fictional organization, for example. Uh, or you can create kind of like CTF style challenges either for um, you know lab work or for a CTF like, event that you're running um, or you um, and you can it also includes um, you know whole courses worth of um, materials including lab sheets and um, you know work for students to, to work through. So the way that um, SecGen works is you start with a scenario uh, and the, you run SecGen, which is based on, um, on Ruby. Uh, it generates a project uh, directory, uh, which basically has all the stuff in it that uh, Vagrant needs to spin up some VMs. Uh, and then there's support for then um, spinning up VMs in either VirtualBox or Overt. Uh, and most of the provisioning at that stage happens via Puppet. So, um, you know, Vagrant will um, start to create the VMs and Puppet will do the provisioning of installing the software and the configurations on those VMs. So the way that we integrate with Overt 
is uh, we have templates in Overt that are uh, base boxes um, that are then provisioned using Puppet. And then once all that finishes is happening with, um, with Vagrant, we uh, SecGen will then set up the networking and things, so it will move those VMs onto separate isolated networks, for example, depending on our, you know, what we want done for that that set of VMs. Um, we'll use affinity groups um, as well to keep, to, you know, groups of VMs together on our um, nodes uh, because of the way that we're doing um, port mirroring to do the um, IDS and sniffing on that. Helps to be. Um, in some cases. So we also create snapshots so that um, students can then um, basically restore VMs to their original state later. Uh, we also, as part of SecGen, we have HackerBot, which is a interactive chatbot, which is an adversary for students. So it will actually um, attack students' VMs and then it allows us to do things like defensive or investigative uh, tasks where the student defends against what Hackerbot's trying to do and will Hackerbot will then reward them with flags if they succeed. So for example they might be told to create a snort rule and when they succeed they're given a flag and they can then submit. Um, and they submit it um, to the Hacktivity front end. Hacktivity is a project in and of itself which is so builds on SecGen and Overt to create a portal that our students use to access all this stuff. And it's also used by us as academic staff to manage the provisioning of all the VMs. So for example, we can have a course uh, and we can say, well, we want to have this specific uh, lab or you know, challenge that we want to give our students. So we'll say, okay, use this section scenario, set up the networking in this way, give us 200 um, you know, copies, for example, and each each VM in that there might be five VMs in that scenario, for example, and then it will um, section will work in you know in the background on the server, and will provision all those VMs. So there will be um, you know provision those hundreds of VMs onto Overt, uh, and then the way students then access that is through the Overt portal. They then claim a set of VMs for a specific challenge. And then they can start to interact with the VMs, um, and that's all via the Hacktivity portal. So um, we use um, Hacktivity um, as the portal for students to actually get to and access and control the over VMs. And so some of the unique features that are in Hacktivity um, is that um, it uses capture the flag based marking. So, you know, it will do the marking. So when students capture a flag that has been randomly generated for them, so every student has their own flags that they need to solve. It might even be, you know, slightly different or completely different challenges they have to solve. Um, and they submit those flags into Activity. Activity then marks the flags and it does things like um, percentage-based. So, you know, most of, the case, most of the time, if we're gonna give them marks for what they're doing, it's, we keep it simple. So. You know, if you complete 100% of the flags, like solve 100% of the challenges on time, then you get 100%. Uh, but then we might have some events that we run, you know, just for fun for our students. Um, and we might give some extra rewards of points for people that submit first. So, you know, um, the earlier you submit flags, the more points you get. Um, we've got late penalties built into it. We've used time tests. So one of the reasons we couldn't use the overt portal, for example, um, to do to access the VMs is we, we've built um, things into Hacktivity so you can say well if it's a time test as soon as you you know so you might need a password to unlock the challenge and then as soon as you start interacting with the VM as soon as you start that graphics console timer starts uh, and when that timer completes uh, it will shut down all your VMs uh, and no longer accept uh, flag submissions we've got leaderboards and scoreboards built into it um, it's designed so our students can access this remotely. Um, and for us, one of the nice things is it automates, you know, all the provisioning of the VMs, it automates the marking of work. Obviously, we still have written submissions from students as part of the course, but we can include this stuff in the, um, to give the motivation for students to engage on a weekly basis. They have these challenges they solve, they um, get the flags, they submit them, and they get those results straight back to them. 
uh, and without us having to like manually mark it, which we used to do. Um, we had used to do something similar, but we'd manually mark all that work. Um, just briefly, I'll mention, um, you know, one of the things that we've, um, you know, worked on is having uh, this front end to overt. How do we actually make it as responsive as as possible? Um, and we found that, for example, when if you use the VM portal for overt, now that we have tens of thousands of VMs on there, it can take a long time to load and things are like actually generally quite slow. Whereas, um, so what we do is we, um, we've we gone through a few iterations of ways of syncing the state, um, but basically we monitor the over event log, and when um, an event happens that changes the state of a VM, we then synchronize that with our um, um, with activity um, so that students basically have incident access to VMs, They um, the changes to state are pushed to them via WebSockets um, from a push from the server, so that they see those changes instantly and it all works very smoothly and, and um, yeah, pretty much instantly. So that's basically what I wanted to tell you about how we're using Overt. Um, if you want to dig into more of the technical details, then um, we've published a number of papers about SecGen and about um, Hackerbot and about how we're using Overt. Uh, and an earlier pilot study we did about just trying to use the Overt portal with our students uh, run publications that we've, um, you know, pub, uh, a lot of these are conference papers, but the papers that we've um, published in the past. So go and check those out if you're interested. Um, and I believe Paul is now going to uh, walk you through um, activity. Thanks. Thanks for that, Cliff. Uh, as Cliff said, I'm just going to do a quick demo of the activity portal. So here's the activity website. And as you can see, it's fairly heavily used. There's roughly just under 15,000 challenges being solved and it's hosting just under 30,000 VMs. There's around about 500 users on the activity part of the system. And because we're, it's vacation time now, there's actually no students online and there's only 34 of the activity based VMs running. If I log in as with my student account, Caps lock off. And I'll just zoom in, I think. As you can see, uh, the students get a dashboard so they can see their progress, how many flags they've found the VMs running and how many challenges they've activated. There's also a historical progress of flags per week. Uh, I haven't actually been using this. I've just started using it to log in for this demonstration. So one of the things students can have is teams. These are allocated by staff, they're not allowed to choose their own teams. So it's more realistic in a, as in a real world setup. You don't get to choose which teams you, you uh, join. 
in a real life scenario. If we go on to the activity activities, we'll see there's there's a, a number of courses, there's some workshops and also some competitions such as capture the flag. The students are given access to particular modules at different times depending what what course they're signed up to and some of them are changed during the year so they're released on a time basis. I so I'll go into this activity web and network security and you can see there's a number of challenges. Some of these are timed and some of them also I've got a progress so that you can see with other students how well you're doing. Most, of, as I say, because we're in vacation time, most of these challenges have actually finished. So in this one, we've got two VMs required, a web server and a Kali Linux server. So if we I activate this challenge, one of the things is to provide the interaction, they can manage their VMs from here. And you can see that it's showing them that the VMs are powering up. If you actually click on this icon here on the consoles, it will go and check to see whether they're up. And if they're not up, it will start them up. And it also will, protect, will detect whether they've been configured and ready to use. And if not, it will stop them trying to do multiple logins. One of the things you can see here, there's actually a timer. So that by default, after five hours, the VMs will be shut down to save resources. They can also revert, which involves going back to a previous snapshot. And also if they've had a lot of problems with the with their VMs, they can actually start from the beginning and get a, num a new set of VMs allocated, but they'll have to begin, from, begin to start from the beginning again. So if I click on here, it'll, it's now checking to make sure that we've got it's all ready for use. And it it's, sees that it's all being configured and provisioned and it's ready for use. So if I click on it again, it'll now provide my VM console. So like I say, in this case, it's Kali Linux. And I'm actually working remotely here, so this is the kind of experience that students get. Uh, so we can do things like change the video resolution. And you can see it's, it's pretty responsive in our case. I 
I think uh, also on this thing, they don't have console access to the web server because that's part of the challenge. So they can't go in to uh, manipulate the web server directly. They've got to do it based on remote access. So, one of the things is the students are allowed to pick their own avatars and aliases or handles. And as you can see, there's some unusual ones here. So if I just log out of this, it's just a brief introduction. So Hopefully you found that quite useful and you'll enjoy the rest of the conference. So thank you for listening.